Hello everyone and welcome to the ACNC's webinar today. Today's topic, as you can see on your screen, staying out of trouble, avoiding charity pitfalls. My name is Matt Crichton and presenting this webinar with me today is Ian Perry, who is the Senior Manager of the Compliance Area here at the ACNC. Hello Ian. Hello Matt and welcome everyone who's participating in the webinar. Before we do get into the topic um, today, just a few housekeeping things to cover. First, if you're having trouble with the audio, um, one of the options is to call in using your phone to call into um, the webinar and you should have received uh, some details about that in the confirmation email which has a phone number and an access code to be able to access the webinar. So that's, that's often a way to fix any audio troubles you're having. Also, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to um, send them through via text. Um, on the control, the GoToWebinar control panel should have an option for you there to send through some questions. We've got some colleagues standing by ready to answer all your questions. We've got Chris, April, Beth and Jenny. So if you've got any questions, shoot them through as soon as you can. But if you'd rather watch the whole presentation first and then save your question for later, that's fine too. We'll have a Q&A session for the last um, what, 10, 15 or 20 minutes or so. Also, if you um, miss parts of it, don't worry. Or if you have to leave early, don't worry. We do record all of our webinars and then publish them on the website later. So if, there's, um, if you want to watch it again later, that's something you can do as well. It'll be on our website. We'll send a, an email to everyone who registered to let you know when it has been published and then you can get a copy of the slides and uh, the recording of the webinar then. So that'll save you taking lots and lots and lots of notes and writing down all the URLs for the websites that we present. You can save that, just pay attention and you can um, wait for the email for many of those resources. Okay, now getting into, into the topic for today's webinar. There's quite a bit here, staying out of trouble, avoiding charity pitfalls. We'll cover some of the main aspects of um, managing a charity and, and making sure that you, you do it well. But we've highlighted a few of the, the real main um, areas that people involved in charities should focus on. And you can see them on your screen here. We've got financial controls, managing conflicts of interest, which is a really common query we get. Due diligence with staff, volunteers and partners, so that in, includes um, employing people and choosing um, all the processes by which you um, get volunteers in. Handling complaints effectively. Transparency in all its forms, I guess. And finally, record keeping, um, a pretty important one that, that often gets charities in trouble. It's one that many charities think is really easy and they can do without any problems, but there are some aspects to that that people really need to bear in mind. Enough from me today, well, not today totally, but enough from me yep. for the time being. I'll pass over to Ian, who will take us through some of these um, aspects of charity management. So the first one, Ian, financial controls, obviously a really important one for people involved in charities. Absolutely, yeah. Financial, effective financial management um, is essential for charities. Um, with the ACNC, we have registered a broad range of charities. Um, we have uh, large charities, charities that are medium sized and also small. And regardless of the charity size, um, it, it's imperative that charities invest in good governance uh, to have uh, sound financial management so that they can actually make decisions in the best interest of the charity. Uh, one of the things that, that we often see with charities is, is that they do have a focus on their charitable purpose yep. and, and providing, um, you know, those services uh, to beneficiaries. Um, they, they sometimes see that, you know, how, how do you balance your resources um, and if you are investing in, in governance, does that detract from the work that you're right, trying to right. do with your beneficiaries? But what I, what I would say to that is that, um, you know, long-term, um, the importance of investing in governance will reap those rewards yeah. and it will actually provide a stronger charity that's able to effectively provide services to beneficiaries yeah. if you have a, a charity that is well run and has um, very strong and effective governance in place. And that, that, that's, that's true of, of financial management, of course. Um, the other thing I would say as well is, you know, the importance of investing in strong governance around financial management is the public perception um, and the risks that charities run if they don't have that sound financial management. Um, 
the charities need to be diligent on this front um, and ensure that they have uh, effective management because they, they are open to scrutiny because they are seen to be, um, you know, using uh, public funds yeah, right. to run charities. Uh, so it's very important that they have effective uh, financial management uh, to, to counter this. So I, I think, you know, the way to implement effective financial controls is to have uh, very strong policies and processes around financial management. Um, it, it's not only, you know, a piece of paper that actually documents what, what charities should be doing, but it's important that they are actually living documents that are utilised in charities yep. and often reviewed and updated as appropriate. Um, so charities that are doing this for the first time and thinking, well, that, that sounds like a great idea, let's implement a policy around financial management, actually take the time to document that. But once it's documented, uh, don't just follow it away, actually yep. bring it out and utilise it and, and continually ask those questions about what is in the best interests of the charity. And when they're, when they're making such a document, it's important to think about um, how this will work in practice, right? Not, not just in the abstract about having good management, that, that's all well and good, but also the practical steps that, that a charity should take in managing their finances. That's exactly right. And that's where responsible persons can actually use their knowledge of the individual circumstances of a charity to make those decisions about how this will apply in practice to result in decisions that are in the charity's best interest. Um, the other thing with policies and processes, it avoids that circumstances where financial controls are heavily reliant on mm -hmm. individuals. Um, we often see that's, that that can be the case um, not always, but uh, but often with the, the smaller charities that you have an individual who knows how to run things yep. um, yeah, and, right. and a lot of the knowledge is invested with that person, but it runs the risk that if that person moves on, a lot of that knowledge is lost. Yep. But if you have those strong governance and the financial policies and processes in place, then if there is a transition of, of, of employees or responsible persons, then those processes are in place so that the, the strength of the charity can yep. continue regardless of who is actually making those decisions. That's a really important point. Um, what about it, when writing a, a policy or having a procedure? We've got a few um, dot points here on the screen that um, that are important aspects of um, this step, we're implementing yes. these sorts of controls. We've got access to bank accounts here. Is, is that something that you see as, um, well, it seems pretty obvious, but it's something that charities maybe overlook sometimes? Yeah, that's right. I mean, a, a lot of it, um, if it's not documented, it can be open to abuse. Right, that's yep. not always going to be the case. And I'm sure that in many cases, people act with the best intentions and actually do yep. that role well. But to, to actually provide a strong and robust uh, process around effective financial management, it is important to have um, policies in place around access to bank accounts, having multiple signatories, for example, yep. um, similar to uh, permissions to spend and, and acquittal of accounts and those those kind of things. We, we talk about separation of duties okay. as being important. What, what does that mean? So that means that you don't have one individual controlling all, all of those functions of financial uh, right. management so that yep. they can actually, you know, they, they have the, the, the controls in place to receive the money, spend the monies and actually distribute it. There's no oversight. And we'll talk about transparency a little bit later, but, but when you have, um, you know, multiple people uh, involved in financial management, then it, then it adds to the, to the strength yeah, of right. the governance. Yep. Um, very important in terms of prevention of, of fraud or wrongdoing in the most yep. serious cases. Yes. The other thing I'd say in terms of um, the ACNC requirements that's actually mentioned there um, on, on the PowerPoint, um, it is an ACNC requirement in terms of the, the duties of responsible persons under our governance standards. Uh, and that, that governance standard is to ensure that the registered entities or that the charity's financial affairs are managed in a responsible manner. Right. So those charities that are non-compliant um, with that requirement can actually be in breach of okay. the ACNC regulation. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it, of course, making decisions in the best interest of the charity to provide that charitable purpose. But if you need another incentive, uh, it's to make sure that you are complying <laughs> yep. with the ACNC's regulations. Okay, so any any charity looking to make a policy or, or write up some procedures for financial controls should really um, consider these five, in amongst other things, but these five um, aspects as, as being pretty critical in, in having a good policy and a good procedure for financial control. That's right. I guess the other thing I would say is that there is maybe with financial management a little bit of a focus on charitable monies, and, and I, I think that's by and large true. 
but I, I wouldn't put out of the equation charitable assets also. Oh, okay. You can yep. think of the example of uh, vehicles that are purchased by charities. Yep. Just ensuring that that's managed effectively mm -hmm. so that any purchase or, or sale of, of assets such as charity vehicles uh, are done in, in a manner that is um, responsible and actually ensures that it's, it's done so in the best interests of the charity. So putting some time into thinking about the financial controls is critical. And as Ian said at the beginning, um, taking time to invest in in procedures and, and, and board knowledge really is, yes. is pretty critical to make sure that you've got the foundations on which to build a, a good charity that can then um, uh, achieve its purposes and, and, and deal with its beneficiaries in a, in a more responsible way. That's right. Yeah, you want charities to, to have that strong governance so that they do have the ability to, to focus on their charitable purpose rather than trying to, you know, deal with administrative concerns that often result if you don't have that effective yep. financial management. Conflicts of interest is another one that pops up quite a bit. And I um, we, we often hear queries about this at the ACNC, um, sometimes advice on how to deal with conflicts of interest or... or ways in which you can prevent conflicts of interest. I think before we get into some of the details, can you just give us an overview of what a conflict of interest is? Yeah, so I would say a conflict of interest is a situation where a responsible person of a board um, has a, a responsibility to make decisions on behalf of the charity, but also by virtue of you know, circumstances where they may have an interest in, in another organisation, another entity, it may even be their, their personal interests. Yep. Um, they will be making decisions that cover both of those areas and that's where the conflict occurs. Right. You're making uh, decisions on behalf of the charity but that charity may have a contract in place with another business. Yep. Of which you have a finance, or of which the responsible uh, okay. person yep. has a financial stake. Yep. So how do they ensure that the decisions are made uh, so that it doesn't benefit uh, that that other organisation right. and disadvantage the charity? So that's one example of a conflict of interest. Uh, there can be very various forms of conflicts of interest, but that's a common scenario uh, that we often see with conflict of interest, which is referred to as related party transactions. Okay, and um, this means that. Um it's not necessarily a conflict of interest in itself is not necessarily a bad thing is it it may just come up as you describe the circumstances in which someone happens happens to be on a board of a charity and also have their own business it may just be that a conflict of interest arises so it's not necessarily a bad thing but the way in which charity deals with it is important that's right so we we often find that charities work in you know in in sectors that are that are often you know they, they, they can actually be in things like health and education, yep. working with vulnerable beneficiaries. And it's quite common for for people who have um, on, on boards of charities who are making decisions to actually be involved in, in the sector in, in our other areas yep. beyond the charity. So conflict of interests will arise. And like you said, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does need to be managed mm. effectively. If it's not managed effectively, whether it's an actual or perceived conflict of interest, that's where circumstances can arise where charities are being disadvantaged because of the conflict. Yeah. And if they if those decisions aren't aren't declared and there's no transparency around that, that's where the problems can arise. So we need to avoid those circumstances. And you mentioned they're perceived or actual, and we've got this on the screen as well. So conflicts of interest can be perceived or actual. Um what do we mean by this? I think this may confuse some people that are that are um uh, listening today, what's the difference between a perceived conflict of interest and an actual conflict of interest? So an actual conflict of interest uh, will occur when decisions are, are made that actually have an impact uh, on, on the charity and also have an impact on, on the other, you know, related party, for example. So that's, you know, that, that can be a, a contract in place where you're negotiating a contract with an organisation and the terms and conditions that are being negotiated, of yep. course, there's actually a conflict of there because the the person that is conflicted is wearing both hats okay. at the same time. What about a perceived conflict of interest? A perceived conflict of interest is is where there is the potential for that to occur. Um, so just by virtue of of a person, um, you know, being in a position on the board of a charity, uh, there there may be some uh, expectations from it could be the community, the public. Uh, it could be other members of the board of the charity would actually says, well, you know, I understand that this person is making decisions on behalf of the charity, but I, I do know that 
you know, they have involvement yeah, right. uh, with other areas that, that we are working with. So how do they actually distance themselves from that so that the perceived conflict of interest is being managed effectively? Often we will see situations not directly with the individual, but there may be relationships between family members and those things that also need to be managed effectively as well because that can lead to a perceived conflict of interest. Right. It's that expectation about um, what will the, we call it the impartial observer test. What okay. would that expectation be if you were negotiating a contract with another business and, and you had a, a brother or, or a family member or a sister uh, who was working with that organisation, I think the uh, the impartial observer test would be that you stand back from those decisions yep. so that even if there is no actual conflict of interest but it could be perceived, yep. that you actually stand back and allow the decisions to be made without conflict of interest. Right. That's a really good uh, piece of practical advice, I guess, to bear in mind that that idea of the impartial observer test. Does this look bad <laughs> pretty much if, if someone was to look at this and does it, even if there isn't an actual conflict of interest, how does it look to an, an outsider yeah, and making right. sure that a charity is um, capable of managing even the perception, even if there isn't an actual conflict? Yeah. And the other thing I would say with conflict of interest is is if there is an effective management of, of conflict of interest and if it isn't declared, um, the poor management can result in reputational risk for charities, yeah, right. uh, which can be damaging to charities' brands. Yep. And also, you know, result in loss of trust and confidence in, in charity. So it can have some significant impacts on charities if they don't manage conflict yeah, of sure. interest well. It doesn't take much for people to label an organisation dodgy on the basis of of, of the, the impartial observer test if it's not managed yeah. if it's not managed well. And you don't That's want that exactly for your charity's right. reputation. Yeah. I, I think it's it's one of the things that will probably be mentioned, um, you know, and people may already have an awareness of it, but the, the ACNC website has some useful resources mm -hmm. around conflict of interest policies. And I think there's even a template policy, which if charities haven't taken that step to think about what policies they would implement around conflict of interest, that template would be a good starting point that can be tailored to the individual circumstances of a charity. So it's a pretty common one, and it's something that charities should be able to manage confidently. And it it's not necessarily a difficult thing to manage confidently, provided that there is some time and, and effort put into things such as a policy or procedure and yep. the, the, the board or the responsible person's collective knowledge about conflicts of interest. If you're confident that the people that are running a charity are aware of what they are, how they can be managed and what the processes and policies for the charity are, then they should be able to confidently um, deal with any conflict of interest that arises. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's all about that preparation and having policies yep. in place so they can deal with it effectively. One one further thing I would say is that the ACNC regulations do require, uh, as part of the duties of responsible persons, that uh, actual or perceived conflicts of interest are declared. Okay. So one thing that can be actually used effectively by charities uh, is a conflict of interest register okay. where they actually, as part of board meetings and minutes, they can actually record any actual or perceived conflicts of okay. interest so in register. Okay, so if it register. pops up, they, they put it down in this register so everyone knows that it's um, it's come up, it's it's been dealt with, everyone knows about it, and it can be referred to later on. A absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a record that, that, that aids accountability. Yep. And if there are questions asked, which, you know, may, may occur, then you can actually reference that conflict of interest and, you know, you can actually reference that as saying it was uh, handled effectively, we were transparent, it was acknowledged and appropriate decisions were made as a result of it. Yeah, right. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on, know your staff is the next one. And it seems, um, it looks a little bit broad, but, but there's a lot to this and it's a really important one for charities to make sure that they, as the title of the webinar suggests, avoid any pitfalls as they um, do their work. So knowing your staff, Ian, that, um, what would you say for charities that are engaging volunteers or employing staff? Um, what are the things they need to look out for? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well firstly, I, I think I'll reference um, the visual there by saying, you know, governance standard four, charities must ensure that the, the suitability of their responsible persons. I'll just explain that a little bit if, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. By actually saying the governance standard four is specific to responsible persons that have been disqualified by ASIC or the ACNC. However, beyond that, um, I've already mentioned uh, today about the, the duties of responsible persons, governance standard five. That's where the idea of due diligence uh, comes in. And, um, 
you know, Government Standard 5, the duties of responsible persons, requires that responsible persons to start discharge their duties with a degree of care and diligence that is considered reasonable. Yep. So that's when we think about due diligence covering all staff, volunteers and employees, not just responsible persons. Yep. And depending on the circumstances that a, that a charity is involved in, there would be an expectation that the charity makes decisions about around recruitment that considers about what is appropriate in terms of background checks or okay. working with children checks that would be suitable yep. um, for the, the, the situation that the charity is in. I mean, one, one example is that we find that that some charities would, would uh, be undertaking activities where they provide services directly uh, to vulnerable beneficiaries. Yep. Um, people often think of that as, as young children, mm -hmm. but it also includes, you know, young young adults. Yep. Um, so in that situation, you, there would be an expectation that uh, to, to implement due diligence that the charities actually implement those additional checks, uh, such as police checks, working with children checks. And that's where there's a little bit of overlap with other regulators as okay. well. Yep. Um, you know, nationally, there's the idea of child safe standards being yep. rolled out and organisations need to comply with those requirements also. Right. Yep. And it is an important point that it's it's not a one size fits all. It, it does depend on the situation of the charity, the nature of their, their work, the beneficiaries and um, the extent to which they need to have a look at um, these these sorts of checks or these sorts of procedures in place um, because it will be more onerous for some and, and less for others and more needed for some and, and, and less so for others. It's about making sure that you know what your charity's doing and, and the best ways to ensure that the people working for your charity, um, uh, you've taken reasonable steps to ensure that they are suitable. That, that's exactly right. Um, in terms of the due diligence and what background checks uh, you should be performing when you're recruiting staff, volunteers and employees, it would be dependent on the circumstances of, of, of that charity about, you know, whether, you know, certain checks are needed yep. um, to, to employ people in positions where they will be working uh, with beneficiaries. I would say that's the due diligence side of it. So just to go back to uh, the, the governance standard four, where people are disqualified uh, mm -hmm. by ASIC or the ACNC, yep. then that then that is a, a more black and white right, approach, yes. <laughs> so to speak, um, with governance standard four. If a person has been disqualified by ASIC or, or the ACNC, then the responsible persons need to actually ensure that they have measures in place um, so that those persons aren't fulfilling um, yep. positions on the board. Yep. Otherwise, they will be non-compliant with that governance standard. Yes. Another aspect of charity management that I think many may overlook or, or take the view that oh, it's not going to happen to my charity, it's not going to, it's not going to involve my organisation, is complaints, dealing with complaints and, and how a charity effectively deals with complaints. This is something that you recommend um, the responsible persons of a charity really think about and, and put some measures in place to ensure that they are confidently dealing with. Absolutely, Matt. Um, yeah, disputes can be very challenging for yeah, organisations right. and I agree with what you said. Everyone has that kind of uh, approach where oh, it's, it's not going to happen to our charity. It won't happen to our organisation. Of course. <laughs> but um, invariably when it does happen uh, and those policies and pro procedures, processes haven't been put in place to effectively uh, deal with it, um, they can actually lead to situations where they are very difficult to resolve. Yep because you don't have that framework uh, to deal with it effectively. So they can take up valuable resources for charities. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. we see it time and again where, where charities are, are there with a charitable purpose to provide services for their beneficiaries. Um, but uh, the, the disputes, whether they're internal disputes or disputes from complaints from beneficiaries themselves, um, they end up you know, detracting from the work that charities yep. are trying to do and they're, they're spending a lot of their time as responsible persons trying to resolve these issues of disputes. So that in itself uh, provides a very strong incentive for, for, for responsible persons of charities to, to invest that time at the front end to have strong policies in place, uh, in place around complaints handling so that when those circumstances do arise, and, and they will arise, um, that, that charities can actually... Uh, have processes in place where they can manage them effectively, um, deal with them efficiently, 
deal with them in the best interest of the charity, but not mm. disregarding the complaints. Yeah, right. Uh, so that they're actually balancing uh, yep. that, that situation so that they can actually act in the best in interest of the charity and manage complaints um, so they can resol be resolved in, in the interest of all parties. Yeah, and having a policy means that you can, as you mentioned, in, instead of taking up time dealing with the, the mess that a dispute can become, just getting it sorted early is, is much better and mu in the interest of the charity, obviously. And you can easily do this by having a, a clear policy and, and procedures that everyone within the charity knows, has read and understands and, yes. and can follow. One of the points we've got there is be open, responsive and consistent. Um, obviously, an option is not, as you alluded to, it, is not to just ignore it. it yes. It's not going to go away. That's not a way of dealing with it. So, so being open and responsive is a key aspect of that dot point. Respond to these complaints um, and whether they're internal or from, from external stakeholders or beneficiaries or donors even. Yes, it's important to be responsive. Absolutely, yeah. We we find that uh, things can escalate if if charities aren't responsive uh, to complaints. Um, so it is important to actually acknowledge uh, that there is a grievance that needs to be addressed, and if you you manage that effectively, then that can often lead to a resolution of the matter, uh, so that you can actually you know learn some lessons from that if it's yep. appropriate to do that and then move on with, with the charitable work that you're undertaking. But certainly those, those circumstances where, you know, an internal dispute is festering and you're yeah. leaving it to the side, uh, then that can actually just uh, become a larger issue that the charity has to deal with and, yep. and ignoring it won't make it, it go definitely away. won't work. Yeah. And um, just, just to reiterate this point that complaints handling, often a lot of people think that it, it, it means dealing with the complaints that may pop up from members of the public. Yes. And that leads to that idea that, well, it's not going to happen to my charity. We, we do things really well. No yep. one's going to complain about us. We don't need to worry about this. It's not only, it, of course, it includes people from uh, members of the public, but it's not only members of the public. It could be the people that you're working with, not happy with uh, something you've done or a service, or it could be internally, maybe a few volunteers or staff members that have an internal dispute. So a complaints handling policy and, and steps to deal with complaints really needs to think about all of those streams dealing with complaints from the public and the internal complaints that's exactly right yeah so when, when we talk about complaints handling we're not only talking about um, complaints about the service yep. uh, that a charity is providing we're also talking about you know internal disputes where we understand that people are passionate about you know the the service that they're providing their charitable purpose. So um, you know a, a situation that can ar arise from that is if people have differences of opinion yeah. about how that service could be provided to, to beneficiaries, then then you have those internal disputes that, yeah. that that can generate. So having procedures in place about how how to manage that effectively. Yep. Um, often, if it is possible, distancing the person who is the subject of the complaint from the complaint management. Yeah, right. That kind of you know yeah it would those make sort of sense. Yep. Uh, so that, that that can actually effectively lead to a resolution. And it's again, it's one of these things that um, sort of has underpinned much of what we've said so far is that take the time to uh, think about this and and draw up a a, di um, a document that actually covers this effectively at the outset so you don't have to you're not chasing your tail later on you've got the the procedures in place to be able to deal with it as they come up yeah that's right if, if people have those procedures in place uh then they have confidence that they can deal with it well if those procedures are lacking or if they're if they're not uh if they're not there at all then then people will you know be a little bit lost in that yep. situation and that's where we said that it, it seems like the charity has a willingness to ignore the, the complaint yep. and that's where things can escalate quickly so it's better to have a an effective policy in place so people know what steps to take to be able to manage the complaint effectively yep and of course as the last dot point says they're regularly review and update policies and procedures so it's no good to just write something put it on the shelf and just know that you've got a policy if no one's ever read it, no one knows what's in it, no one knows even where to find it. it yeah. It's got to be something that everyone knows about and has read. That's right, yeah. Policies are only valuable if, if they're used effectively. Transparency. This is obviously a, a principle that would underpin much of all charity operations, I would guess. Yes. Um, and as it says on the slide here, it can cover quite a, a range of areas. So what would you recommend for, for charities when thinking about uh, best practice of management um, when considering um, the principle of transparency? 
Yeah, so transparency or you may think of it as, as accountability, it, it covers a range of issues that we are discussing today. You know, there's an expectation of having transparency around financial management, which we've already discussed, around conflict of interest. We, we spoke about the transparency in terms of having a register yep. for accountability. Um, we'll talk about record keeping a, a little bit later, the idea about having transparency around record keeping. So it is very essential that, um, you know, Charities are not only making decisions that are good, but they're actually documenting those decisions right. so that they actually have those, you know, records uh, to be able to say, here's what the charity has been doing. And, and, and it's open to scrutiny. Charities yep. should, should have a willingness to be open to scrutiny yep. and, and be transparent and accountable. That, that engenders uh, public trust and, co and confidence in the work that they're doing, which right. is very important in, in the sector uh, where charities are, are working in. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, the importance of, of transparency is that there is a, a risk um, that charities that, that do lack transparency, they may be more vulnerable uh, to fraud or wrongdoing. Right. As, as individuals um, may look to exploit charities yep. if they see there are vulnerabilities or an opportunity to hide or disguise fraudulent activities yeah, and right. transactions because of that lack of transparency. Uh, okay, yep. Well, if there are dark places to hide, then then it may it may cover some um, nefarious. Absolutely, people. yeah. So it's more the the serious end of the scale around consequences, I, I would say. But but something to be aware of because. Um, Certainly, something that that you don't want happening to your charity yeah. in terms of fraud, and it, it does happen um, that that fraud will will occur uh, in in charities as it does with other organisations. Um, so, having strong uh, policies in place and transparency and accountability will be a means to actually deter people from committing fraud. So, just having a look at some of these dot points here. The first one: how funds are raised, used, and distributed. So that's um, making sure that the, the charity is open about these processes and, and the actions taken and that they're not um, they're not keeping anything from their members or their supporters or their donors. Just being, being open about um, the way they spend money is an important principle. That's right, yeah. So how funds are raised, used and distributed and, and ideally this would be in a policy uh, where, um, you know, the, the charity can point to the policy and say, well, this decision was made because it was in line with our policy right, and right, it represents yep. the best interests of the charity to make these decisions and spend these funds these ways. Yep. Um, so, yeah, absolutely having those policies around that is, is essential. And having the documentation to show that, and this is what we spent money on, this is how much was spent f for these reasons. Absolutely. And the second one, criteria for beneficiaries to access services. This is one that I think some people may overlook. Um, just to be clear, open and transparent about what the charity is providing, to whom and under what circumstances. Yes. So charities need to, to make uh, decisions um, about how they provide their services and, and I'm, I'm sure that um, all charities uh, that, that work in the sector, they don't have unlimited resources. Yeah, so right. they do need to make decisions about how they distribute uh, their services to the beneficiaries. So having policies in place and transparency around how these decisions are made often uh, are a way to, to deal with any complaints that may arise if yeah, someone right. is denied services. Yep. Charities can actually point to this policy or the process they have in place and say, well, we understand that you would like to, to access uh, these funds or, yep. or this service, but uh, as per our policy, we actually make these decisions. Yeah, right. Uh, and so that, that's that's the transparency and accountability. If it's lacking and it's not there, then, then people will reach their own conclusion. So it's important yep. that you're actually able to document this and have transparency around the decisions so people can understand the why of the decisions. Yep. And similarly with <clears throat> internal issues too, so it's not just about... Um, being transparent to those on the outside and showing how your charity is being, being run and how the funds are being managed. The third dot point here with good governance. So if, if you've got a, a board of directors or a committee or, or whoever's in charge of the organisation, how the decisions are being made and how, how the issues are being discussed also should fall under the principle of transparency too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about annual general meetings there and, and board elections, often when there are internal disputes um, if there is no transparency about how elections uh, may occur or how people can even nominate uh, to, to be elected for a board, then it's only going to make matters worse. Um, but if, if, if there is, uh, you know, transparency in the organisation and they're very upfront and open about how these processes occur, how decisions are made in terms of governance across a, a range of issues, 
then that instills confidence in, in, in the people that they're not being sidelined or yeah, restricted right. from the charity, that they're actually able to, to access the, the charity and the charity is being fair and reasonable in those matters. And we've spoken about how transparency can help you manage conflicts of interest, both actual and perceived, and also reporting. So if you've got this um, underlying principle of transparency running through all your operations, reporting to uh, regulators or, or different agencies, whoever you have to report to, and even to the general public, becomes much, much easier. Yeah, that, that's that's correct. Um, you know, in terms of uh, a charity's financial statements and, yep. and audited records, if, if, if they are transparent um, with those reports, then it instills confidence in the general public that the charity is actually spending those public monies um, wisely yep. and actually doing so without a, any you know, sense of, of fraud or private benefit that may be uh, being yep. obtained. Which brings us to record keeping. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's something that um, can get pushed to the side, I think, because it's, it's paperwork, it's admin, it's, it's the sort of stuff that, well, frankly, can be boring, um, but it is pretty important. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, I would say it's similar to, to financial management that we actually started the conversation with. That it, it, an investment in strong governance around record keeping will result in benefits uh, for the charity in the long term, and and charities shouldn't see this as, as something that's detracting from their ability to to pursue their charitable purpose. That actually having uh, strong record keeping policies will actually benefit the charity yep. and actually. Uh, you know, enable it to, to, to meet its charitable purpose. And it's um, not only financial records, right? I think when we say record keeping, a lot of people think, oh, it's just my financial statements and they yeah. sit in a folder on a shelf. It's also operational records. That's right, yeah. So uh, a lot of people equate record keeping to dollars and cents, but yep. you are right. It's also operational records uh, as well. Uh, in terms of, of keeping those records, uh, you know, it'll be unique to the individual circumstances of each charity, but it could be, you know, re records of, of, of housing for beneficiaries yep. in, in some situations or care that's provided to, yep. to people who need medical treatment. Those Basically, kind of the, the, the stuff that charities have done, <laughs> really, the, the activities, yeah. yeah. Yeah, record keeping is essential. It goes back to transparency, which we we're uh, talking about before. The other thing I would say uh, about record keeping is, you know, it is it is something that that um, you know charities do struggle with. Uh, yeah. We see from time to time. So where policies are inadequate, it can lead to charities being in a position where they're unable to effectively ma manage the charity finances. So. Yeah, right. So that, that, that's that's focusing on on the financial aspect of record keeping, but that strong record keeping actually allows charities to to make decisions um, that are, are sound decisions, reflecting on on the work that they've been doing and how they can actually make improvements in the work that they're doing. That's a really good point. If there's any sort of improvement or desire to improve or, or even expand the charity, in some cases, mm -hmm. charities may want to start doing something else, something new. Yeah. Um, having a, a good, thorough, uh, comprehensive backlog of, of records can really help and inform decisions, inform the board when making decisions on, on future activities or future investments. Yeah, that, that's correct. And I don't want to focus on this too much because, uh, again, it is kind of like a, a minor proportion of, of what occurs, but individuals looking to commit fraud or, or gain a private benefit will exploit situations where there is uh, poor record keeping. Yeah, right. Um, you know, records can be lost, stolen or manipulated if, yep. if those strong uh, policies aren't in place around um, effective record keeping. Yep. Um, the other situation we see from time to time is um, in situations where there are internal disputes, uh, paper records can be misappropriated um, and it's recommended that secure electronic records be used to prevent this yeah, from right. occurring. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, just being proactive and thinking about those circumstances so that ideally that circumstance wouldn't occur where there was an internal dispute and records were misappropriated, but how would you actually mitigate that from being a risk? How would you have uh, electronic records with, with backup procedures to prevent that from occurring? Because it will, it will be a major disruption to charities if yep. records are misappropriated, stolen or lost. Yep. Uh, it can have a very significant impact on a charity's ability to pursue their charitable purpose. Again, so record keeping isn't just <clears throat> the boring aspect of um, filling in paperwork and, and storing it in the right files and filing cabinets. 
it, it, it really underpins um, much of the, the strength of an organization's uh, governance. Absolutely. Yeah. Investing, again, investing in, in those uh, procedures around record keeping will strengthen a charity and enable it to, to, to work effectively. Okay, we have a few links there to um, specific resources on our website. Um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, these will all be included in the email that goes out um, in, in the next day or two um, to all who registered for the webinar. But if you wanted to um, get get some issue specific resources, they're the they're the uh, URLs that you want to follow. Brings us to the end of the formal presentation, but we do have some time for uh, questions right now. And we have had a few questions come through. So, Ian, if you don't mind, I will throw a few questions your way. And yep. if you are out there and you've got a few questions now that you've seen the formal presentation, um, feel, free to, feel free to shoot them through. We've still got April, Chris, Beth and Jenny answering questions and if there are some that come through that we think will be um, useful for the wider audience, which many of them will be, we'll um, try and get to them now. Okay, um, just bear with me a moment. Let's have a look at the... Okay, uh, we've had a question about record keeping. Just finish mm -hmm. that slide. Um, do, we, do, do charities need to provide the ACNC with a copy of records? No, no, they don't. So the expectation is that charities uh, do obviously keep records, what we were discussing, but there is no onus on charities to provide those records uh, to the ACNC unless it's requested uh, by the ACNC to, to support our, our, our regulatory work. Um, so in some circumstances, we will request charities to provide those uh, records to the ACNC. Yep. And the requirement is that charities uh, keep records for a period of seven years. Oh, okay. Right. So the ACNC can request uh, records for that period of, of seven years. Yep. Uh, again, we would expect that charities have effective record keeping practices so that they are actually able to um, access those records if requested. Ideally, they'd be able properly. to just get them. They, ideally, it wouldn't require a big long search to find the records if you're doing your, if you're doing um, if you've got good practices of record keeping. Absolutely, and and yeah, there, there's the benefit there in in spending a little bit of time about thinking about how you know you, you effectively you know keep your records yep. and, and access them because uh, when they are requested, we do find that charities with poor policies around record keeping find it difficult to yeah. to access those records. Um, so, you know, investing that time at the front end about how you store your records and what records you keep is very important. Yeah, if anyone's tried to find an old bill from something sometime once before, it's, it's a nightmare to try and, try and find pieces of paper that you thought were long gone from years ago. But if you've got a really clear record keeping yeah. system, I really need to implement one for my own personal life, I think. But if you've got a yeah. really clear record keeping system, it makes things so much easier. Absolutely, yeah. In terms of record keeping, you know, we're, we're talking about a range of records. So we spoke about not only financial records, but operational records, including um, minutes of board meetings. Ah, right, yeah. Very important that, that charities are accountable and transparent around, you know, their decision making in, in board meetings and they keep those in, in, in official minutes. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, kind of going back, um, just broadening on, on that question a little bit, um, the importance of record keeping. Transition of staff. Uh, ah, okay. Again, if, you, yep. if you're keeping poor records and you've got a new staff member coming in, they'll, they'll, they'll look at the organisation and, and have find yeah. it very difficult to understand what's occurring. But yep. if, if good record keeping is in place, then they'll be able to move into that position, yep. transition into the role and be able to quickly adapt yep. to the role, understanding what's happening with the organisation. Um, another question here, or a question here about, um, I think you touched on it before, the, the people that um, are maybe um, ineligible to be on the a charity's board or work with a charity. The question is, can an undischarged bankrupt be on the board of a charity? Yeah, so that's right. So we were talking about that in terms of, you know, the, the context of, of background checks that charities uh, should undertake for their uh, employees, staff and volunteers. With uh, responsible persons, uh, it, it is a requirement as per one of our governance standards, governance standard four, that they are, are not disqualified by ASIC. Um, right. If they are disqualified by ASIC, and that includes uh, people who are disqualified um 
by virtue of the fact that they're an undisclosed bankrupt or undischarged bankrupt, then that would um, rule out that person from being able to be a responsible person okay. for a charity board. We, we see some circumstances where um, the actual decision uh, by ASIC uh, occurs while the person is actually already on the board. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. In those situations, uh, there would be an expectation that the charity board deals with that promptly in yep. a prompt manner yep. and actually um, makes decisions to, to remove that person from the board right. um, in, in, a situ in a process that is not unduly delayed. Okay, right. Um, does the ACNC require board members or directors to undergo a police check? And, and actually, just, just before you get to the answer there, um, yes. I think... I think we may have inadvertently been a little bit confusing for a lot of people in our references to boards, board members, directors, committees, responsible persons. Pretty much they all mean the same thing. It will depend on the organisation and some structures uh, call their um, their board the board or some call yeah. it the committee or whatever. But yes. when we say these words, we're using them interchangeably to mean what the ACNC generally refers to as a responsible person, which is a member of the charity's governing body that collective group that is responsible for um, directing the the charity and the organisation. So if we say board member or committee or, or director or, or responsible person, yes. just know that we're using these words um, interchangeably. Yeah, we, we do tend to use them in interchangeably and that's by virtue of the fact that, that the charities uh, themselves are often names, use yeah. them interchangeably. So uh, we, we do cater to that flexibility a little bit. But in terms of going back to, <laughs> to the question, does the ACNC require board members or directors to undergo a police check? Uh, the, the, the strict answer is no, it's not a requirement as per the ACNC, but there is an expectation as per uh, Governance Standard 4, the suitability of responsible persons, and Governance Standard 5, the duties of responsible persons, uh, that, that charities actually implement that due diligence to ensure that the yep. persons who are filling those, those roles on, on a charity board as responsible persons are actually uh, appropriate right. to, to do so. Uh, again, I'll, I'll try to make that point and, you know, if it, if it is a little bit uh, confusing because we are talking about legislation, I'd refer people to the website where there is um, some very good guidance around it. But with Governance Standard 4, if people are disqualified um, from ASIC, yep. um, then they are unable to, to fill a position of a responsible person on a board. So even if the strict answer to this question in particular is no, the ACNC doesn't require a police check for a new board member or responsible person, it doesn't mean that um, a charity can't do that. If they think that, that this is in the best interests of their organisation in, in selecting new board members or even employees and, and, and volunteers, then then um, th they can um, conduct or ask police to check on the background of, of anyone that they would like. That That's right. So I, I guess you, you could see this as, you know, appropriate decision-making um, regardless of whether an organisation is a charity or, or any other right, business, yep. if they feel it's appropriate to undertake those police checks to have an understanding of of the person who's filling that role and it's actually a, an effective, um, you know, risk management strategy in terms of recruitment, yep. then they should be doing so if that's in the best interests of the charity. Yep. Uh, and particularly around charities where we see that it is important in certain situations when you're working directly with vulnerable beneficiaries right. as well about risks that are, are in, inherent in those situations. Yeah. One thing I would say about <clears throat> the disqualification, and I've spoken about Governance Standard 4 already, um, so I, I hope this will be the last time I raise this, <laughs> but there may be particular situations where charities can apply to the commissioner um, where people are disqualified. Oh, okay. uh, so just uh, being aware of that if you do find that you're in that, that situation, uh, something something to be aware of. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, here's a question. Uh, touching on board members again, responsible persons as we often refer to them. Yes. Can charities pay or employ board members? Yeah, it's a question that, that often arises uh, in the sector about uh, remuneration of board members. Um, the first thing I would say is uh, do the rules of the charity, often um, recorded in the constitution, do they allow for payment of, of board members? Yep. Uh, so that's the first thing uh, to consider because you, you need to abide by the charity's governing rules yep. when you're considering remuneration of board members. The, the next question uh, after that has been answered would be, uh, is it in the best interest of the, of the charity to remunerate board members? 
uh, for example, um, rather than actually remunerating board members, would it be more appropriate to employ actually paid staff who right. aren't members of the board to undertake right. those services where it, you know, it, it is seen to be appropriate to, yep. to get remuneration for the duties that are being undertaken? The other thing to consider, and I won't go into too much detail, but uh, different state and territory requirements uh, may uh, have an influence on whether uh, board members can be remunerated. Okay. And uh, charities would need to to in che uh, check with their, their state and territory around rules around incorporated associations, for example, around yep. responsibilities of, of remunerating board members. What I would say if, if a charity is uh, considering making decisions around remuneration of board members, uh, there's some very good guidance on the ACNC website about remuneration of board members, and that would cover um, the full range of issues that need yep. to be considered um, when you are remunerating board members, if that's a decision that is made, um, it's one of those things where you want to get it right before yes. the decision's made. You don't want to make the decision and then start thinking about, oh, did we do the right thing? Because that's when uh, problems start to yep. arise. We don't have actually have the link to that one here on the screen at the moment, but it is, if you've got a pen handy and you wanted to jot it down, it is acnc.gov.au forward slash board remuneration. But we will include it in the follow-up email that goes out in the next um, day or two. Yes. Um, okay. And a question about record keeping again. I know you've um, gone into quite a bit of depth on record keeping today, okay. but there's there's an appetite for it out, for it out there. Mm -hmm. um, where should records be kept? Well, first, is is there? I'll expand on this person's question for them. But is there a, is there a requirement that a record, records are kept in a particular way or a particular form? And then, is there a way that they should be kept? Um, so records uh, need to be able to be produced to the ACNC uh, when they are requested. So the records would need to be kept in a format uh, yep. that it, that um, assists that. So okay. uh, they can be written uh, yep. paper records. Yep. They can be electronic records as long as they can be produced yep. to the ACNC as the regulator when they are requested. Uh, I guess if you think of the situation of records uh, being verbal, then that's a situation uh, that, that can lead to, to concerns in terms of record keepings. Yep. What I would say on top of that is, is there, there is a bit of flexibility there around records being able to be kept in paper format, electronic format, but making those decisions around, well, both are possible, but what's in the best interest of the charity and what is effective record keeping? Yep. You know, keeping records in a secure format that is easily accessible, they're the kind of things that charities should be thinking about when they're thinking about storing records. Yep. Um, one question, going right back to the start of today's presentation when we spoke about financial management, um, a question about the need to have a financial professional on the board. Is, is that a requirement for charities? And if it's not a requirement, is it a recommendation? So I think the person asking this question might be thinking of someone like an accountant or, or a yeah. professional financial advisor. Should a charity seek the um, participation of that sort of professional for their board? Oh, look, I, I would say that it's it's probably a good idea if there is capacity to recruit board members to a charity that have financial expertise and often um, expertise in, in financial areas come with other areas where they can uh, add value in terms yep. of governance. So I would say certainly that's the case. I am aware that you know, charities of different sizes have different capacity to recruit course, board members yeah. uh, with, with those specific skills. So you know, at one end of the scale, we're talking about very large charities where they will have, you know, specific resources dedicated to, to financial management and risk management and those kind of issues, as opposed to the other end of the scale where you've got your smaller charities, uh, which are operating in perhaps a little bit of a niche. Yep. Um, they might not have the resources to, to bring those board members um, in, into the yep. charity. Um, it, it's something that can potentially be outsourced yep. as part of the, the governance of, of a charity where, um, the, you know, the use of an external accountant yep. to, to assist with record keeping and financial management may be appropriate in some circumstances. Again, depends on the, the charity, its circumstances and, and what it's uh, capable of doing. Yeah, yep. that, that, that's right. And the important thing is that, that charities actually take the time to consider uh, those, those implications and what's in the best interest of the charity. Uh, the, the charities that that, uh, that we sometimes see as you know getting into situations where they are non-compliant with their responsibilities around um, you know effective financial management, for example, they're the ones who are 
you know, primarily focused on their charitable purpose uh, and aren't okay. thinking about governance. Yep, yep. Um, so, I mean, the fact that we've got people participating in the webinar today shows that they've got that incentive to improve their governance. So, in, in that sense, we have people who have already taken that step. But, yeah, certainly the message that I would have for, for the sector as a whole is take that time to think about governance and don't be solely focused on the charitable right. purpose. And we've got time for a couple more, but I think this, this one... Um, this question might um, be of interest to a lot of people. It's touching on what we just mentioned there about the, the size and the nature of an organisation. So what would you recommend for organisations that are small, don't don't have the capacity to employ an accountant or to um, encourage a professional financial advisor to get onto the board and that sort of thing? The really small organisations that want to avoid these charity pitfalls, want to have the best processes in place, but they are really small yes. and um, just simply don't have the resources to be able to do it. What would you say to those organisations? Well, I'd say to those organisations that um, although it may seem like a daunting task uh, initially to actually, you know, provide an overview of your charity and think about what governance and policies and procedures are required to actually have effective and strong governance. It's important to take that step. As I said, initially it will seem like it's detracting from the charitable purpose, yep. but coming out the other end, if a charity does go through that process and invest that time into to governance, it's going to make the charity that much stronger yep. and actually lead to, to better outcomes for, for the charitable purpose and beneficiaries. With the smaller charities, I think a lot of work has been done by the ACNC to provide tip sheets and, and fact sheets on, on our website, which can be the starting point yep. for charities. I'm not sure if it's going to be the answer. You know, I'm not making any promises that yeah, people yeah. are going <laughs> to download one PDF and their problems are solved. It is often the starting point to, to allow charities to understand what the issue is and what they need to, to do to implement strong governance. But um, for those charities that are very small and, and they're, they're coming to a uh, they're coming to the sector without that background of, of being, you know, experienced in governance, that would be a very good starting point for them to understand what the common issues are. Yeah. A little bit similar to what we've been talking today in the webinar about what are the common issues that they need to address and yep. how can they go about addressing that with good governance. Well, maybe that can be a starting point. So rather than thinking about governance as and the, the policies and the procedures that come with it as this large abstract esoteric notion of something that you, no one understands or wants yeah. to really think about, just breaking it up into the practical elements of, say, finances, volunteers, um, complaints handling, yes, these sorts of things, and then just taking the time, whether it be an extra meeting or, or an addendum to an, a meeting that's already longstanding, to just think about, right, finances, what do we need to improve or implement or, or write in a policy that yep. is suitable for our organisation and then doing the same with other other um, important issues, as the, the ones that we've gone over today. So breaking the big scary notion of governance into its constituent parts is probably a, a really good step and don't underestimate the importance of just taking the time to think about it. I know, yeah. as Ian has mentioned, it, it may seem like you're ripping time off your charity from from dealing with the the front end um, beneficiary work, but we, we can't really reiterate this enough: is that taking the time to think about the the support and the structures that go into um, pursuing these charitable purposes is really um, critical in getting it all right. Yeah, and having that governance in terms of processes and policies in, in place is, is a very effective preventative measure. Um, th those charities that find themselves in situations where they don't have the governance and problems have arisen, they can be very difficult to re resolve and yeah. end up taking far more resources than would have taken if they had those uh, policies and procedures in, in place uh, initially. Yep. Okay, I think that brings us to almost one o'clock and... Um, the end of, of today's webinar. If we didn't get to your question, um, we will be able to get in touch with you via email later and answer your question if we can. Sometimes questions are a little bit too specific for us to answer on the webinar about your organisation and the details of your organisation. In those cases, we probably recommend giving our advice team a call on 132262 and they'll be able to talk you through whatever the issues you're, you're dealing with and provide some really good advice. 
Um, but for those that we weren't able to get to, we will respond via email later. And of course, as I mentioned, we will send a, a recording, an email follow up with a link to the recording of this webinar and the webinar slides and, and, and all the resources. Of course, you can always stay in touch with us in other ways. We have the commissions column, which goes out fortnightly and, and regular email updates. You can sign up to that, you can subscribe to that online on our homepage. Also, there's lots of web guidance. We've touched on much of it today and we have podcasts, video content and, and webinars such as this, all recorded versions as, as well that you can go back and have a look at. And the number there, 132262 is our advice team and they're happy to help you with any queries you may have or email us advice at acnc.gov.au and we're pretty active on social media as well. Thank you very much for participating today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Matt. We hope you found this useful and um, we really thank you for your attendance. And if you have any further questions, we'll stay on the line to try and um, answer the last remaining questions that come through. But otherwise, we will um, endeavour to get to your issue via email. And just finally, if you do have any questions, comments, or some feedback for us about the webinars in particular, this is separate from questions about your organization and, and best ways to manage it, but just about the webinars or any other guidance in particular, send us an email to education at acnc.gov.au. We love receiving the feedback and looking at ways to improve. Thanks once again um, to for joining in to this webinar over your lunch break. If everyone else's stomachs are rumbling as much as mine is, then they're pretty keen to get to lunch. So thanks very much, everyone, and we'll be in touch via email if we haven't got around to your question. Thank you. Thank you.